Today we bring you the third turn of the Pyrrhic War, marking the halfway point of our campaign. If you watch turns 1 and 2, then you know Steve spent the years 280 and 279 BC campaigning in Sicily. Like the real Pyrrhus, he failed to conquer the entire island, but he did capture the great city of Syracuse, one of the three main objectives for the war. The other two major cities, Rome and Capua, are on the Italian mainland, and that's precisely where Steve wants to strike next. Today on Little Wars TV, the Pyrrhic War comes to the Roman heartland and the Greek advance will not go unchallenged. The year is 278 BC. Brothers and sisters of the Senate, I humbly offer my services to the citizens of Rome. I shall not mince words, these are desperate times. If I am elected consul of Rome, I recommend that we move aggressively southward, follow up Miles Gloriosus' victory by pushing the Greek back into the sea. For this campaign season, Rome will need an experienced veteran of many foreign wars, and I, General Maximus Flatulence, am that man. <sighs> My fellow Senators, this war is not going well. In fact, the only victory that we have is because the Carthaginians actually have the balls to fight. This war is a joke. This Senate sits here and does nothing but idle talk. Action must be taken. The strength of Rome is its legion. And you must pick me, Antonio, Starcinius, to lead the legion. But before I leave you, you must know one thing. I am Ferris Matis. The election for 278 BC was our closest margin yet. But with 55% of the vote, Antonio Starcinius won the hearts and minds of the Senate. And Starcinius enters the consulship in a difficult position. Paris is well established in Sicily and the rules of the game prevent any Roman expeditions to the island. Sicily was historically in the Carthaginian sphere of influence, and remember, during the Pyrrhic War, Rome and Carthage were nominally allies, but they did not coordinate directly. Before the armies deploy for turn three, both sides are given a free diplomacy action. The campaign mechanics reward players for winning battles or capturing regional capitals, and during our last turn, Miles won the Battle of Panormus, and Steve forces surrounded Carthaginian army to surrender at Syracuse. These victories give each side one diplomacy role to try and influence a city on the map. Antonio targets Heraclea, hoping to persuade the citizens of this Greek colony to become neutral. But the role fails and Greeks are unmoved. Steve targets Venusia, which you'll note is marked with an oak leaf, the symbol of the Samnites. Samnite cities are strongly anti-Roman, giving Steve a plus one to any diplomacy attempt. And he rolls high enough to flip Venusia to Greek control. Ten, of course. I am welcomed with open arms. There are flowers thrown at my feet. Each side now deploys their armies for the turn. Two for the Romans, one for Carthage, and two for Pyrrhus. Our players in the game don't know the exact strength or composition of the opposing armies. This information is hidden from them. But with so much concentration in central Italy, the stakes for turn three are clear. When I came into this turn, my intention was to focus on the Italian peninsula itself, I'm done with Sicily, uh, and pick up strongholds, small cities, as close to Capua and Rome as possible so that I can really lead a push in the fourth and fifth turn. But now we've got four armies facing off against each other in very close proximity. At this point, I don't necessarily want to engage in an all-out uh, Goddard Damerung here in central Italy. Uh, but if it has to happen, it has to happen. My preference would be to bait Dave into attacking me as my army is much better on defense than it is on offense. So that's basically what I'm going to be doing, trying to consolidate my power in this area and hope that I can go Dave into attacking me this turn. Another Roman pretender. Dave opens the turn by dividing his armies, sending one of the eastern coast of Italy to Lucyria. It appears like an invitation for Pyrrhus to attack, and Steve does seem to consider the possibility, but in the end, he stays true to his defensive strategy. He wants to bait Dave into attacking him. 
So Steve marches an army to Askelum. The Greeks fail in their first attempt to storm the city by force. That fails. But the Romans enjoy the favor of the gods at Lucyria, seizing the city and fortifying the Roman sphere of influence across the peninsula. Dave spends his next few operations in Sicily, marching the Carthaginians to Acragas and then on to Gala. A brief siege attempt ends in total failure. While Dave dithers in Sicily, Steve manages to complete his assault on Asculum and march down to Barium. At first glance, it's a puzzling move as the Greek armies are now widely divided, providing Dave a tempting opportunity to attack the lone Greek army sitting in Asculum. But what Dave does not know is that Steve's army at Barium is a small force, the minimal army size of 500 points, and he sent them all the way down to Barium specifically to lure Dave into attacking Pyrrhus' main force. And sure enough, with the sixth action of the turn, Dave advances his lead army from Malaventum, seeking battle. Pyrrhus sits in the middle of Rome's bosom. We must do something about that. So I shall advance my main army to drive Pyrrhus from the heart of Rome. We have ourselves a fight. Using the Age of Hannibal Battlefield creation rules, Dave and Steve are each dealt a hand of cards they alternate placing on the table, face down, to shape the terrain. Steve is pleased to have a major river and a stratagem that will allow him to place dummy troops, making his army appear larger. But Dave has a hidden stratagem of his own that I'll let him explain in a moment. Before then, we have a battlefield to create. Once all the cards are played, the players reveal them and start arranging the terrain accordingly. And as our battlefield of Asculum takes shape, it becomes clear that Steve has found himself the perfect defensive position for a pike army. There is a major river anchoring his entire left flank, and he placed the river halfway under the table, narrowing the frontage he must cover. The rest of his deployment area includes two substantial hills and a screen of woods. This is precisely the battlefield Pyrrhus dreamed of finding, and now he has the Romans right where he wants them. I do not fear Dave's legions. He would have to come up a hill straight into the teeth of my pike. What I have learned from my combat against Miles Gloriosus, however, is that ranged weapons can chew up my phalanx from a distance. Therefore, my intention is, based on his early moves, to decide what to do with my cavalry forces to get them out into the field and constantly harrying his ranged uh, ranged units to keep them from focusing fire, running out the clock as much as possible, and uh, eventually forcing panic on Dave's part to actually have to do something to attack me. My original plan was to defend the high ground and make Pyrrhus come to me and fight him on my terms. But it appears that Pyrrhus has his own hill and has no intention of coming off of it. So while I could sit here and watch him, that would be unRoman of me, for Rome always attacks. So I will move within range of him, engage him with my archers and my scorpions. The one concern I have is this large amount of cavalry on the flank. I have cunningly placed my adjutant, the bookish yet reckless Darius Maximus, in charge of my cavalry, which is waiting behind the woods and hopefully will surprise his cavalry. Dave's cavalry remains hidden off table in ambush, but he has positioned them here in case Steve decides to be bold and rush forward on the flank. Dave is able to lay this trap because one of the cards he was dealt in the pregame setup was an ambush stratagem. It seems both commanders have a trick up their sleeves as the battle begins on turn one. Wasting no time, the Romans immediately push forward in the center, screened by a line of villites. The Roman heavy infantry follows behind. To Dave's surprise, Steve does not squat idly on his hill in a defensive posture. Almost immediately, the Greek skirmishers are racing out across the river to meet the Romans head on. To threaten the Roman flank, thousands of Thessalian cavalry surge forward on the far fringe of the woods. The very same woods where Dave has an ambush patiently waiting for them. First contact is made on turn four in the center of the battlefield when the two front ranks of skirmishers collide. The loss of skirmisher bases in this game is insignificant and does not impact either side's morale clock. Victory in Age of Hannibal is measured with your army morale clock, and both start at a value of 9. Whichever side suffers the most losses each turn must lower the clock by 1. The first army to hit 0 has lost courage, cohesion, and the ability to carry on the fight. 
With the skirmish lines engaged in the center, Steve now makes his move with the massed Thessalian cavalry. He splits them into two columns, sending one to threaten the Roman rear and another slicing across the middle of the field to roll up the Roman skirmishers. But Dave is ready with counter moves of his own. First and foremost, his ambush. Dave springs the trap, mauling the Thessalians on the flank with heavy losses. And Dave doesn't want to waste any time in the center either. He pushes the Roman Estate through the skirmish line to engage the Greek-like troops and clear them out. With the battle now raging and Roman heavy infantry committed, the moment is right for Pyrrhus to order his pikes in the battle. But the pikes do not move from their elevated position overlooking the bloodbath below. It is only now that the full scope of the Greek plan becomes clear to Dave. Steve never intended to fight a meeting engagement at all. He only rushed his light troops and cavalry ahead to delay the Romans and play for time. Roman heavy infantry steadily gains the upper hand in the center, driving the Greeks back toward the river. But this is precisely what Steve had in mind all along. See, and then this, and then this, this Pyrrhic countdown is gonna start for me, and I'm gonna lose. I've been playing a delaying game the whole time. I thought he was a tiger. Some have called me the greatest general they've ever known because I make wise decisions like this. All right, so you will uh, you will go down. Uh, well, you're, we're not the end of my turn. Combat. Yeah, you yeah. will go down to four. Hours. Tabletop engagements in the campaign have a built-in turn limit of sorts. The defender is required to place a camp that must be held, and the attacker is given ten turns to close within six inches of that camp, or else his morale clock is automatically lowered each turn. And by turn 10 in today's battle, Dave is not yet within reach of the Greek camp. Dave knows that time is running short for him to win a decisive victory. But he's close. Steve's delaying strategy has been costly, incurring major losses among the Greek-like troops and cavalry. Late in the battle, both armies are dangerously low in their morale clocks. The Roman options for attack are limited by the river. It has fords, but only one base can cross a ford at a time. Dave's best chance is to press along the wooded Greek flank. He cobbles together all of his cavalry and remaining villites to hurry through the trees before the sun can set across the battlefield. Both sides know this battle is coming down to the wire. The Roman subcommander commits himself to lead a cavalry charge, only to be met by Pyrrhus himself. If you watched our Pyrrhus documentary on YouTube, you know that he was no stranger to personal combat and liked to lead from the front. And Steve, playing the role of Pyrrhus, is ready to put it all on the line to keep his right flank from collapsing as dust creeps in and victory is so close at hand. Is there a chance people can die? Sure you want to do that? Uh, well, if I, if I were already demoralized, there's not a chance in hell I would do it because a double demoralize would force right. me to retreat. Now, in order to wipe it out, you got to double it, which is still possible. But it's, ah, you're all in. I like it. I, yeah. Good. I like it. So I'm going to have three fantasy mounted four with Pyrrhus, so I'm going to plus six. All right, I am light cab. No javelin. Man. No javelins. For room! Nine plus two. You're not going to go. Eleven. No, I know. I an, I Did I at least hit you? I got an eight. So yeah, you demoralize me. Koku that. So now I'm down to two. Pyrrhus survives the combat, but his household cavalry are driven back and the morale clock inches closer to zero. But the Roman morale clock will be lowered as well because Dave is still not within six inches of the Greek camp. Two to two, it's a nail biter. If it wasn't for this damn sunlight Sun. disappearing, <laughs> I would have him where I would need him. I shall rally my cavalry so they can finish off Pyrrhus. <laughs> Edit that. <laughs> well, I'm already engaged everywhere. They can't cross the river. They're out of range because he backed up. We're coming! We're coming! Come on! Alright. Uh, yep, so I'm still a two, plus one is three. He's flying. It should be this. Well, no, demoralized me. So, so, so two, three, three, four. Back to two. I'm at three this time. I think I did that right. Three, one, two, plus Pyrrhus is four, flanked three. 
11. It's a kill. Maybe it kills that can. And potentially your sub commander. As you decapitate my <laughs> minion. It's a four. Captured. You captured. Pyrrhus leads him back and chains himself. Okay, so I won that turn. Mm -hmm. And you, so he would take two this time, right? So that's it. We're done. In true Hollywood style, Pyrrhus wins the final combat and captures the Roman sub commander, sinking the Roman morale clock to zero. It truly is a Pyrrhic victory of sorts for Steve. His army has suffered heavy losses, and in this campaign, players each have to roll for every base eliminated in battle to determine if they are permanent or temporary losses. These two are fine. I'll roll for these two hoplites. Mm -hmm. They're both fine. Yep. I'll roll for these two light infantry. They're both fine. I'll roll for these three light cav. Steve rolls fairly well, and most of his men will return to their ranks but there are some heavy losses sustained among his valuable Thessalian horse. Roman losses are not as severe, and unlike Pyrrhus, Rome can replace all her losses every turn with fresh levies. I will lay siege here. Dave's secondary army lay siege to the Samnite city of Boviamum, attempting and failing two assaults. I will try again to lay siege to that stupid city. So I'm now plus four. Why do you think it's going to come to your side if you keep calling it stupid? Seven. No. Meanwhile, Steve slips to the western coast and manages to storm a city, adding it to his growing empire. Next year, I will have two routes to Capua. For the tenth and final action of the turn, Dave has one siege operation remaining. He makes a third attempt to take Boviamum, and this time the gods smile upon Consul Antonios Darkinius. Okay, all I have left is a siege, which my armies are in places that I already own, so. Right. The campaign season is over. Well, at the close of the third campaign season, I could not be happier with the way things are going here on the Italian peninsula. I have moved farther north and now have secured two separate routes to Capua and in the process met one of the perfidious Roman consuls in the field and crushed him soundly. Soundly. I can only think that whatever poor consul they throw at me next year will be quaking in their boots as I get even closer to the cities they don't so dearly wish to protect. Pyrrhus out. I, Antonio Starcinius, have made good on my pledges to the Senate and to the people of Rome. I promised, number one, that I would secure the entire width of the peninsula, which I have. I have taken two new cities, and we now firmly have defensive positions across the entire peninsula. Second, I promised that I would wage war, as no other Roman has, against Pyrrhus. I met him on the field of battle, but Pyrrhus almost refused to fight. He hid on a hill and fed rabble to me, which I cut down like wheat, but still it slowed my advance. By the time we had him penned onto the hills, the sun was setting, and I was forced to abandon the campaign. Next year, we will continue this fight, and Pyrrhus Either will grow a spine, or he will run out of places to run to, and we will kill him. Bold words from our departing consul, but it's true that Pyrrhus did flirt with disaster at our Battle of Asculum, putting himself at personal risk. We talked at length to Professor Adrian Goldsworthy about leadership styles in this period and why Pyrrhus seemed to have such an appetite for high-risk, high-reward encounters. When Pyrrhus is born in the, the latter part of the 4th century BC, this is a world that's gone through incredible upheaval and it's still going on. And you've had the spectacular career of Alexander the Great. And when he dies and you have the Wars of the Successors, the funeral games, call them what you will, you know, everything is uncertain. It's incredibly violent. Virtually nobody dies of natural causes. 
You know, they tend to die in battle or more often get executed, murdered, or occasionally commit suicide. So you're growing up in a world where power is very fluid and that's dangerous. So Pyrrhus is growing up in a time where if you are going to be anybody, you're going to have to fight. In some ways, Pyrrhus almost represents an ideal for this Hellenistic age of the successors. You know, he is personally very brave and he comes closer than anybody else to living up to the Alexandrian example in his style of leadership. The fact that he fights all these single combats and keeps winning, that he takes these wounds. When you look at Pyrrhus's campaigns and you compare his leadership style to his Roman opponents, Plutarch provides us with several accounts of Pyrrhus fighting hand to hand, you know, striking down his opponent, killing his opponent, sometimes the opponent's rescued by friends and carried off. There is clearly this Homeric tradition that is more pronounced, more important to aristocrats, to royalty in the Greek world that emphasizes personal prowess. With the Romans, again, we face a problem that we know later on a Roman commander is clearly not expected to fight hand-to-hand -hand as a matter of course. And that's largely because he has other things to do. And when you think, if you look at the manipular system, from the start you're deploying the, the center of your army, your heavy infantry, in three lines. And whilst there have been some fairly wacky ideas in the past that, oh yeah, you know, they would just let the centurions and tribunes send them in whenever they like, they knew what they were doing. This is clearly so that the commander can commit reserves and waves of troops under control. And, you know, you have that interesting comment in one of the sources that Triari was supposed to begin the battle kneeling, which always reminds me of the, you know, the Zulu practice where your reserve would sit with its back to the, the enemy so they couldn't get excited and join in before they were supposed to. The Roman army is more organised. It relies on reserves, it relies on committing people to battle gradually. And the commander is there for a different purpose. The commander is not a king. The commander is someone you've elected to lead you. So the commander is there to control, to direct, to inspire, sometimes to fight when it's required. And you do have signs of this older Roman tradition, like, you know, Decius Mus, the, the devotio, dedicating himself. You know, I will die in this battle if the gods give us victory. Um, you have, later on, Claudius Marcellus, you know, um, who's killed in fighting against Hannibal, who is credited with having fought multiple single combats and, you know, winning the Spolia Opima. Um, so they have that tradition. There is that tradition of heroism, but it is, it is heroism to be shown in an appropriate manner by an aristocrat and an elected um, leader, rather than a king who is doing this because he and his companions must sort of try and outdo each other and must live up to each other. And that, you know, in the Macedonian ideal, every man in the army, every Macedonian is your companion, is your, your comrade. And this may be that Alexander is simply the epitome of this tradition, or it may be that Alexander reinforces that tradition so much that to be, you know, one of the reasons that Pyrrhus is remembered is because he can do an Alexander. He doesn't just win battles, but he kills people. He goes up against tough opponents and cuts them down. Next time on Little Wars TV, Pyrrhus makes his big push against Capua. It's our biggest turn yet with a surprise ending that you'll never see coming.